show. Three, two, one. We are back with episode 11 of Dads Do 75 Hard. Yeah. Uh, Adam had some things come up today. Um, he's doing a panel um, discussion on kind of his life and things like that. But we got to interview him. I got to interview him before this talk. So I'm going to try not to let that be biased. Um, but we're going to kind of give an overview of what it was like to when we first met Adam um, and our initial thoughts of him. And then following this talk, we'll clip Adam's interview, which will be good. So Vince, uh, you've known Adam how long? So he's a year younger than me. So he came into high school. I kind of knew of him, but we, we hung out in different social circles mm -hmm. for the most part. So um, didn't really know him a whole lot through high school. And obviously after high school, everything kind of goes different directions. Really got to know him, know him um, when I started reffing football, this okay. week, which will be four years this year. Okay. So um met him at one of the clinics that we had here in town and uh again kind of like that oh hey how's it going like knew him um, yeah so how much older than he was how much older than you in school no he's younger than i am oh younger than yeah you. he's a year younger than i am so you were a senior when he was a junior yeah nice what was high school adam like i don't know yeah, you know, i didn't really hang out with him yeah, yeah. he he was i said just different social circles i was in rotc and yeah and that so you don't stuff. remember like any stuff that you just wasn't around him no nope. yeah just things. totally different circles never really came across him i don't even remember if we had any classes together yeah or nothing like that wow so, that's interesting but yeah once football started and then that's when i mean it was an instant click nice um and pretty which is really nice because that whole group of refs that we're with i mean just the, especially the Friday night crew, we yeah. just all clicked together real good. Nice. So, like, when you met Adam, gosh, so four years ago, so what was the initial, like, it, obviously it was around reffing and appreciating, yeah. but, like, what was your initial, like, thoughts of Adam or takeaways or? Well, I had seen other people share stuff of him on Facebook. Um but he seemed to like have his head on his shoulders, went yeah. into the military thing, yep. did that stuff. Um, didn't know much about his family life or anything like that. So it was just that initial reaction. I was like, all right, again, we talk about a fit person. Yeah. I had that initial, and I was like, okay, he's put together. Like, yeah. you, you already have that, okay, he takes care of himself. So, right. uh, so yeah, I mean, just uh, seemed like a good dude. And then once we got to going with things and then, the relationship formed and got to know more about his family mm -hmm. and, and through this, just learning more about him yeah. and his past and all that stuff. So, yeah. yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I met Adam. He came into church in like 2019 and I just remember kind of the same thing. Like he's obviously when you're a fit person, mm -hmm. you stand out. So, and, knew, his, and his fashion sense. Yeah. So definitely <laughs> saw like Adam's fashion sense. Like he was one of the few guys that like would come in. I'm like, Gosh, I remember Christmas service that after he started coming, he was in like a turtleneck, like a green turtleneck with like plaid khakis and like, sh and I was like, okay, this guy is, I was like, this guy's wild. I was like, I don't know what he's wearing. Like we're pretty like informally dressed yeah. church and he's like dressed like he's like getting ready for like a photo shoot in like the eighties. And I'm like, all right, well this guy's definitely got his fashion sense about him. <laughs> So, uh, and I'm up in like jeans and a t-shirt on Christmas and Adam's in there like turtleneck and chain chilling. So no, I think when I met Adam, like didn't know a whole lot about him. Um, obviously like, I think I got to know Adam more in terms of like, I needed him on our Turkey bowl team cause I needed an athlete. Uh, so took, put myself like in the, like, I got to get Adam like for team stuff. Yeah. Like, church basketball, church football, um, and then got to know him better, um, had his niece and his daughter in youth group, and so kind of knew that just of them, um, but then like wanted to get to know him better um, just because I felt like we aligned on a lot of stuff, so went and grabbed coffee and talked, and, and so Adam and I have kind of like been friends for a while now, like three, three years, um, but then yeah, leading into this and seeing more of his story and talking with him and, and seeing like 
the struggles and the growth and the challenges and then also just like him continuing to grow it like as he's progressed like I think early on like and we'll get in with you next week but like I don't think any of us ever pictured like doing something like this no so it's been cool to see Adam's Adam's growth in that um outside of his fashion growth <laughs> um I think he has more shoes than Kelsey oh wow yeah so not here he likes that so yeah I guess that kind of like so then as we got to know Adam like I would say he was in the gym gym in the morning um mm-hmm. but it wasn't really until the Arnold last year where like I really like went and like hung out with him yeah like so yeah I guess would that have kind of been the same for you like that trip last year no well, you had football. we had football so we had every Friday night and you get to see a different side of somebody when it's Again, something that they're passionate about. Yeah, what's his demeanor like in officiating? Um, he is kind of like the three of us. He's yeah. the quieter of the three. Yeah. Um, but he'll let loose every now and then, and it, uh, but it's fun. Like, yeah, it's something we like to do. So you get to see that laid back side a little bit yeah. more instead of just okay, I got to do this and you know at work or whatever. Yeah. Dealing with family, it's it's the laid back. I can relax. I'm with the boys jokes come flying and uh yeah it's it's a good time especially the drive there and yeah the drive back you know the drive there's a lot of prep but then we also yeah joke a lot and we always got snacks and stuff like that and then on the way back it's just a same thing just reflecting on what we did what we could have mm-hmm. done better and that, yeah. still nice fun. yeah i think what stands out because i'm on i'm on the opposite side of, of you guys yep. and i get mad at you guys um, but for Adam, for the listeners, if you ever go to a game where Adam's officiating, he's the one sprinting up and down. Like, I'm like, dude, relax. It's a four yard game. And he's like, ding, ding, yep. ding. So not that you don't sprint, but don't Adam's on another level. I'm, I'm in the middle. Oh yeah. I'm with the big boys. You're just watching out. Yeah. You keep your head on a swivel. So yeah, I think that kind of that idea of like, when you get to, so why I wanted to kind of intro his talk with us kind of sharing is like, you're going to see things that like in relationships as they grow whether it be friendships or business acquaintances or whatever like as you get to know people better you start to have like learn things from them and and seek wisdom in other people and and be able to share and build on that and so i think we i think we can be a testament to that with like adam in terms of us but then also us to adam um but yeah i think the main takeaways of was his fitness level Yep. His uh fashion sense. And then uh like I think early on in getting to know him was it was just like a growth mindset. Like he was willing to learn yeah. and want to get better in all things. Yeah. Which was refreshing because a lot of people are just stuck in their ways. And and ready to just stay where they're at. Yep. They're they've made they've uh, they've arrived at their destination where they're gonna be for the rest of their life yeah they're happy with the the status quo and yeah and i think for us in this part like we want to push back against that constant growth on a constant quest for knowledge constantly learning and so i think adam does a good job of that in his life in, in family and in, in his work and in, in church and in an officiating um yeah so it's good yeah nice well now you guys will get to hear any other closing thoughts on adam Adam, when you listen to this, know that we did roast you. Not really. But, uh, he was all concerned about that. That we were going to, like, he wasn't going to be here to defend himself. Oh, don't worry. So, we just see that to Blake. Yeah, just Blake. <laughs> but, uh, so, next up, you'll hear Adam's interview of Adam's background. And, unfortunately, today he was not rocking the turtleneck and chain. So, we'll head to that interview <laughs> now. I need to do, like, a transition. Like, whoosh, whoosh. I'll just have to plug it in. <laughs> 75 hard. I'm here with Adam Mock. And I'm going to get this mic all set up for me. There we go. And uh, so a little different today. Busy schedules, busy lives. Yeah. Um, Adam's got a panel that he's doing this afternoon. I'm going to go get to talk to some guys that are looking to transform their mm-hmm. lives. Um, and so Adam's here a little early. Vince is going to join us later. Um, so a little heads up on that. We're going to interview Adam about his kind of life journey, story, um, his testimony. Um, and then Vince and I will talk at the beginning of this podcast about um, – kind of our initial thoughts of Adam and how we came to know him. So, uh, Adam, we've heard you talk yes. for 10 episodes, but we don't really know your story that well. Mm. 
um, like I mentioned with Vince or Will mention, I knew you as the record holder for the longest pick six in oh, Matthew High School history. Yeah. Um, but there was life before that epic play. <laughs> yeah. Um, so kind of walk us through like what where'd you grow up? What was life like growing up? Um, and then we'll just kind of go from there. Well, I'm pretty much born and raised here in Mattoon. Um, we'll get probably here. I spent probably eight years away in the military uh, on and off. Did a stint, a stint of school. But, um, yeah, I'm an 80s baby. So I got... Uh, what year? 82. Oh, boy. Yeah. So I remember, well, Elevate here at, the, at our mall, you know, this was once... Department store. What store was it? It's been Elder Beerman. Oh, yeah. Nice. So, um, that takes you end up. Yeah, that takes you back. For, for you. Yeah, you know, any Elder Beermans around anymore? Nope. <laughs> so that ages you. Or Bergners and all oh, that man. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Bergners. Nice. Um, no, great. Honestly, a great childhood. Um, our pastor, you mm-hmm. know, Jeremy, he was a neighbor of mine. He was quite a few years older, but, um, you know, the, the saying's real, streetlights come on, you go home. Yeah. Um, wiffle ball in the backyard. Uh, there was a school, you know, uh, we play hard, it was a hard ball baseball, knocked out a few windows, hmm. but it wasn't, you know, frowned upon a whole lot. Yeah. They just had to say, just hit towards that way. You know, yeah. it wasn't like they come in and shunned you and the whole, yeah. the whole dynamic and stuff. Um, these kids were being kids and they were out there playing together and they loved that. Um, so up until I was eight. Um, you know, my parents got a divorce. That was, a uh, kind of a defining moment in my life looking back. Um, so could you tell, like going into, like you're eight years old, were there signs at eight or was it just like no. it was just wild. blindsided, blindsided, wow. literally down at the friend's house. Dad came and got me, um, went inside. Mom was there. Dad said, mom's moving out. Mm. Um, so then that begins the journey of being really really in, independent mm-hmm. as a nine-year-old eight-year-old boy yeah um tv dinners figuring out ways to do your homework walking home from school dad's still asleep or working a 12 shift and i'm at home by myself till my mom picks me up mm-hmm. um packing a bag every week um you know just that whole figuring everything out what i'm I mean, basically the i said before forward thinking planning backwards mm-hmm. like I was figuring out what to wear throughout the course of my next week, and I had to pack that all into a bag mm-hmm. to make sure I had everything that I needed, underwear, socks, the whole shebang, because, yeah. I mean, I had clothes, but not accessible, mm-hmm. and so um, so that led to just a little bit more independence for me. I was able to, you know, which, you know, was a good thing later on in life, um, but it was my life for a really, really long time. So what was Adam like from like eight to like your high school age, so like through wild, even as like a young kid, I like mean, eight to like eight to 16 before you could drive and do all that. Like what was life? Like, I was honoring honoring. Yeah. I mean, I never got like, I would say in trouble, trouble. Yeah. Um, my mom, um, she was pretty good about letting me feel the wrath if mm-hmm. I would screw up. Um, she worked for the school district, so anytime, I think, she, knowing now, I think she was pretty pretty good about talking to my teachers, mm-hmm. so that way, if I was messing up, she would say something in a roundabout way without me knowing, but be like, I'm I'm watching you. Yeah. And so, like, that was always in the forefront of my mind, because if I got trouble at home, or trouble at school, I got trouble at home. So there was still some, like, extreme independence, mom and dad are separated, but then there was still that, did you feel like your parents were on the same page discipline wise like when you got home or was it different at dad's house versus mom's house no i mean i i've always said you know that even though i was a divorced kid i had like the best parents yeah you know kind of on both spectrums of it really because they did get like like i said blindsided because i never witnessed a whole lot of fighting if any Mm -hmm. and then just the communication even after Obviously, there were tiffs, and majority of that was just financial stuff because they did split everything 50 50. And this mm. is back in the day where, you know, mom's got majority of yeah. the money. Well, it wasn't set up that way. It was joint custody because it was a week with my dad and a week with my mom. Mm. So, no matter what the cost was for anything, someone got the bill, you pay the other half. So, that was good for me to see. 
because they were still managing to be able to communicate because they were still wanting the best for me. Yeah. So that was the discipline part and all that was was still good for me. So was that your like did you I did you allow that to like it was a hard question to think back to like 10 years old but did you allow that to kind of like become your identity to a point like well I'm the kid with divorced parents or because at that time was that super common like nowadays kids you know the majority of the kids in youth group parents are separated but you think back to like 1989 you know was that common no i mean it was probably the beginning of like where our numbers are at today Mm -hmm. honestly um but i was blessed with a great class Mm -hmm. of friends both uh you know had a lot of good guy friends and a lot of good girlfriends and their parents being together Mm -hmm. that i've always said I, i had like 10 moms yeah you know and there were dads that um you know i would with their son, I was just kind of like, kind of like what Vince described mm-hmm. with that one boy, yeah. the Colts, that white. Yeah. I would, I would go over to certain guys' friends' house just because there was a dad present yeah. a lot of times, you know. And then it's nothing against my own dad no. because, like, we played catch, he played basketball yeah. with me, you know, but he worked a factory job, and there were just times where he just yeah. couldn't be there for me on those types of things. So at that age, like, because high school's a little different when you start to get your own independence and think you know everything and, and do that. Like, I think we all have experienced that as young men. But growing up and being around those houses, was there, like, a family that you looked at that you were, like, this is, like, envious of? You were, like, this is, like, when I go to this house, like, I wish my parents were together and, and dad worked, like, was able to work like this or be present, like, in those in that area you know i no that's good honestly yeah. because not that i didn't i mean because i you know i think a lot of my friends even still and the parents they're still together it's just i i don't know i, I love my mom and dad yeah and so that's and, neither, and neither one of them were never not present that's and fantastic. so like i got i'm i'm as i'm blessed yeah because that isn't always the case, especially with the kids today. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to kids today, like, some of the ones that I work with, like, they really hate going to dads or hate yeah. going to moms <laughs> because it's so different um, and just a different style of life that they have to live there than when they're the alternative. And no. So that's good that both, I mean, split custody, split custody, but then also, you know, having... A foundation at each home it's hard oh it's super hard yeah because you want them to be together mm-hmm. no um, i go well, elizabeth who yeah obviously I speak well, there's a good example yeah, and that's i claim her as my own all the time even though like genetically she's not mine yeah we do have her majority of the time and i mean do i wish that she was mine absolutely yeah you know but like i also know that she has a dad yep that she has to like figure that stuff out for mm-hmm. herself so for me being in a position to where i've been her yeah there isn't a lot of people that have been her, yeah. you know, where they have to split that time. Um, and so, like, I, I feel her pain yeah. a lot of times when she comes back from her dad's for a lot of different reasons on things that are done differently compared yeah. to what's done at her house, you know. And, like, is it as upsetting it is for me to not be able to just let her express herself because I want her to understand that as long as she's under our roof, like I'm going to treat her like my own daughter, mm-hmm. and there is no ifs, ands, or buts about that yeah. because I do cherish her because I know her since she was three mm-hmm. when I met her mom, and so yeah. like to me she is like mine. Yeah, you know, and so like I'm never going to treat. How her. old's Pearson? Five. So yeah. 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 Like so, be two years younger than that. Yeah. That she's been a part of my life. Yeah. Asher. So my kid's age. Right. Like, you've been so, a part yeah. of her life since three. So think about that. Yeah. Asher doesn't remember. Asher's yeah. not going to remember three. She doesn't yeah. remember not having you. Right. And that's exactly. And yeah. I think that's, that's a good thing in yes. a sense of where, you know, because, you know, we'll probably get to here in a little bit, but like she's seen my growth yeah. from the time who I was compared to who I was last, say in the last five years, mm-hmm. you know, I've changed. Mm-hmm. And I would assume that she would say, you know, for the better when we bring her on the podcast and you can ask her a few questions, mm-hmm. you know, like, but like she's a real testament to seeing my change and in my growth as a, as a man comparative to when you know she first met me yeah so as a young man as let's go high school age what was high school adam 
What was high school like for Adam? Adam was cool. Adam, Adam, Adam thought he was pretty cool. That was my first impression. <laughs> that Adam's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Adam, Adam thought a lot of Adam. Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I was, I was pretty decent athlete. Yeah, you're you know? a pretty good athlete. So I, I mean, I, I was used to just winning. You mm-hmm. know, having that just that confidence, but not being humbled. Yeah. Not being told, hey, pump the brakes here, the one. You know, you've got some some growing still to do, and yeah. there's a whole other world out there. Continue to grow, but let yourself feel a little bit of that of that uh, that humbleness. So now go back to that. What if somebody had that conversation with you? How would that have even gone though? Like if somebody told you at 17, "Hey, you're a little full of yourself." What would your response have been in that moment though? Oh, I, mean, I wouldn't like it at all. You wouldn't have liked it. I wouldn't like it at all. Yeah, because and that's what I like. You know, I coach football at the high school. Like, how do you how do you have that conversation with a kid? You know, I say kid, Mm -hmm. young man, but because you were, you had this confidence and this aura that you were the guy. Yeah. So then, for someone to say that, like, I mean, high school did kind of give me a little bit of a humble experience at times, um, because obviously we we played in a conference that was a lot tougher. Um, but yet yeah, still in Mattoon though, mm-hmm. like locally, yeah. like you can get humbled on the field, but then you get to go back to school and be, yeah. you know, still somebody, somebody. Guess, yeah. So a name. what was high school? Like, what was your priorities, your <laughs> lifestyle? Like, you know, splitting time with parents through high school, having more independence. I mean, I spot honestly, like I spent most of my time trying to be popular. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't concern myself a whole lot with grades, Mm -hmm. Um, and that's probably where if I would degrade my parents, that's where they lacked the most. Um, Not saying I was approachable in in those areas, but that also didn't start early enough to where I knew that was a focal point as well. Like whereas now in our household, grades are are a big deal. Yeah, you know, so like that's always going to be at the forefront of their mind Mm -hmm. because we've laid out those values of what the expectations are, what those values are in this house, because these certain things are not acceptable. And if school is going to allow you to still be a part of something, but your grades aren't quite where we want them, well, as us parents, we're probably going to pull you from that, regardless of what the school says, because we hold our own standard. And as much as it would pain us to have to do that to them, a lesson has to be learned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just is, and I think that's a good thing. Well, that wasn't necessarily... No, the case for you. No, I mean no. So it was. So then, grades wise, backseat sports were king. Mm-hmm. Sports were number one. What was socially? What was life like through high school? Man, just running around having a good time and chasing girls, man. Yeah, a lot <laughs> of. Uh, I'm sure there was a lot of um, appropriate yeah. behavior. Yeah. No, I mean enough not to get in trouble. In trouble. Yeah. I mean enough to. Kind of where you, I think there was maybe once or twice where we like, were really told, I mean, Coach Temples, there was a couple instances where he had to get involved because it was a football related thing. And, you know, we learned from that pretty quickly. Um, But most of the time, again, blessed to have even, not so much my parents, but just even my friend's parents that it only took the one time to like, to kind of have that gut check of we need to probably pump the brakes a little bit on some of our antics. Yeah. So here's here's a question that I like to ask um, older people. <laughs> LOL. So if you were placed back in high school right now, mm. you're 17, what changes what changes do you make to high school, Adam, with the knowledge and the wisdom that you have now at 40 to go back and how would you operate now? Um, definitely academically. Sure. But I know for an absolute fact, I did not train Mm. as hard as I should have with the time that I had Mm -hmm. in those four years as as an athlete. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was unfortunate to have two knee surgeries, Mm -hmm. um, and almost 18 months apart. So that kind of delayed a little bit of just people caught me. Yeah. Um, in a sense, not that my height was any, any real factor because it was just, I, 
quote unquote, I lost a step. Yeah. You know, um, but with that being said, we had a facility. Oh, yeah. We had we had the coaches mm-hmm. um, to be able to allow ourselves to become better athletes. Yeah. And I well, I did a dad talk, and it's it's so windy in the one that I just did, but it was about performance mm. and um, um, potential. Yeah. Like I don't know how many times I heard, and you've got potential, you've got potential, but you lose with it. Yep. Because you got to perform. If you're going to win, you got to perform. Yeah. Because if you, I, I consider until you're blue in the face and talk about your potential, but it's up to you to go out there and execute that potential because it's there. You were given it. Yeah. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. And I, I definitely dropped the ball on that, on that for sure. It's good. I think going back, like looking at that side of it, like in four years, I go back and look at like, man, I had so much time. Mm, yeah. And now when you don't have the time because you've got responsibilities and a family and a career and but in high school, like you got so much time. Now it feels busy. Kids are drawn mm. a million directions. Yeah. But when you prioritize it, like you've got time. And more time than you'll ever have in life. And so trying to get kids to understand that it's the same thing. Like if somebody told you you were being, you know, needed to be humble, you wouldn't listen to it. So how do we get the next generation to understand like the opportunity in the 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 position that they're in to take advantage of those four or eight years mm-hmm. like college yeah. like you went a different route but like I look back on like high school and college like man I had so much time and I didn't take advantage of it until the final year and then yeah. I see the growth in the final yeah. year and I'm like oh my goodness what if mm-hmm. I would have started that at a freshman in high yeah. school um that mindset so that's good so then you graduate Assuming academics weren't, no, yeah, graduated. no, I, I was. Well, yeah. You still graduated. You still had to walk. <laughs> you yeah. yeah, you still graduated. Um, and so then, what made the decision to go military? Um, I was twenty three. I so I'd been well twenty two. So I my four years here out of out of high school, and not that I was, you know, people still knew who who I was for the most part. I worked in jobs where I was out in the public, so people saw yeah. me. Where were you working? Uh, the Alamo Sick. at the time when that was really the only place. Yeah. I mean, that and Cody's. Yeah. I mean, that was the only joint we had. Yeah. yeah, I know. Um, I had to, I, I always say I had to burst that Matt Toon bubble. Yeah. Um, it was time for me to allow myself to see certain things. Um, I wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. I, I tried to go to Lakeland. Yeah. Um, I don't, just, I wouldn't even go to class. Yeah. Community college. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I had, I had some chances to go to a four year, yep. um, financially just couldn't swing it. My parents weren't going to pay for it and they were pretty adamant about, um, don't get student loans. Yeah. You know, at the time before I know what it would have been even back then, but, yeah. the, the fact still remained that, and I think they knew that I wasn't cut out for it either, I think. And they didn't want me to, it's, it would have been a huge confident killer for me, too, if I yeah. would have left and then just fell on my face and had yep. to come back. So not that I didn't still kind of trip a little bit, but I was here close. Sure. Um, they could kind of keep an eye on me. And so, yeah, I just it was a quick fix um, for me to just get out quick and see what my there's a family, I guess, heritage there. You know, my granddad served in World War Two. You know, my half brother, he served for the Air Force. Um, so there was just that fi- family dynamic of serving, um, and just hearing my granddad's stories, hearing my half brother's stories about just what it all entailed. Yep. Um, it just sounded like it's something that would appeal to me. So did you just go to the recruitment office and just walk in? More or less. Yeah. yeah. I and said, then, yeah, I just said, Hey, sign me up pretty much. So then what did that look like? That, that chapter of your life from walking in to, to being deployed because this would have been 2000, been 2000, early 2006 when you walked in. Mm-hmm. So then what did that life look like? How soon after, you know, walking into that office? It was the unknown known. Like yeah. I knew what I had to do and what I was embarking on. Because obviously yeah. we had two front wars going on. Right. But then it was just the unknown of the military. Like what, what was that going to look like for me? Because mm-hmm. obviously you see the stuff, the yelling and the screaming and, you know, that whole process and... Like, it was just, yeah, it was, it was terrifying. Yeah. So when did you, so where did you go to basic? 
Uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. And so that was eight weeks? Nine. Nine weeks. And then you, how soon after, did you go to any special schools? Yeah, they, I mean, you take an ASVAB, they kind of yeah. set you up with whatever um, job you'd like to have based on your score. Um, did you I, get the job that you were kind yeah, of looking at? Yeah, because um, it was, well, I just figured it was a job that I, at the time, could utilize, which is heavy construction operator, and I could run excavators, dozers, cranes. Mm -hmm. um, the crane was a big thing because I was like, that's a big money maker. Yeah. Um, and so, did that for seven weeks. So basically, yeah, no. To, so to your point, I went, I went as soon as I, 16 weeks worth of training to Fort Benning, Georgia, which because I was active duty, mm -hmm. to once I got in process, I get to my company. They said, um, you realize the company deployed four weeks ago, right? I said, no. Like, you know what that means? You're gone. Don't, don't unpack your bags. Yeah. And so like, I'm like, Okay. So what was that? Part? So you're in Fort Benning, Georgia. They tell you that your your company deployed four weeks ago. Don't pack your bags, and then you just get on a plane. Mm -hmm. Well, they. I mean, I got to come home for a couple of days. Okay. Like so I called because um, they asked do you. Um, would you like to go home? Because we're leaving. The process that process starts. Takes on, some time. Yeah, it takes it was on Tuesday. So and I got there on Thursday, so I could basically hop back on a plane, come home, see my family, and then do the whole. The whole thing. So then, do you just fly like commercial to like? Yeah, I mean, they contracted commercial airliners to take. So where did you fly out of? We well, we flew out of Atlanta, which then took us to Germany, which then took us to Kuwait, and then we spent a lot of time in processing to the you know the war zone. Yeah. As far as your pay, um, and then there's some obviously some acclimation to the heat. Yep. This would have been July. Okay. So like you get off the plane, like <laughs> it's it's like a blow dryer. Sure. You know, the, the propellers of the plane and whatnot. But um so then yeah, you're living in tents and then you're just kinda waiting for you to get a flight out to where you're supposed to go. Uh, you know, our our higher enlisted guys, the staff sergeants, they're in contact with the company on where they're gonna place us. And so then yeah, one night we hopped on a bird and you know, I flew to Alkine in the dark. Pitch black, and it was wild. So, like, what's your first night like in Alkine? It was well because they were all everyone was asleep. Um, so, I mean, it would more have been just me waking up the next morning because yeah. it was more of a seclusion, secluded um, fob. Um, it was like a little village um, that we were in, and we were in like the marine zone. We were in the Al Anbar province, but dude, it was like super surreal. Mm -hmm. Like, you just can't really describe you know what you see when you do finally see it and then whenever you start going on all the patrols and the convoys and you start seeing the locals and you start seeing like how they live and how that whole that whole dynamic of how they live and how all well, that's set up it's just like you know that that humbleness and that gratefulness really starts to really yeah. kind of sink in that conviction of you know we don't have it that bad right you know so you're on patrol, but then the majority of your time is you're building bridges yep. and, and, and basically build re like rebuilding the structure that was mm -hmm. torn down in like well, it's so like yeah, fights. We, yeah, they they whether it had been us or Afghan um, or yeah, yeah, the um yeah, because these people got to live right, and so it it's just a matter of how it is we're going to make them because. Idle hands cause the most trouble. Sure. And through the course of that whole duration of that deployment, they sort of realizing that, you know, we need to get these guys gainfully employed. Sure. Because, and if it's us doing it, then they're more, it's just that win the hearts and minds right. mentality. And it, and it, and it, for the most part, worked well. But I mean, obviously, you had a lot of instances where it, and it backfired. So did you see, like, what was your, like, did you see active? Like deaths, not de I mean I don't I'm not getting into that, but like, like, like combat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were we were part we were, we were a part of some pop shots even during our car convoys, especially once we started going to Ramadi. Gotcha. Um, you know, a lot of so Ramadi would have been like you know you're going into you yeah know, a mess. Right, because once because what we started up north around Syria and then we had Aditha, um, and then Habania. And then Ramadi, and then we actually did a portion of um, 
time there in Baghdad, the southwest part of Baghdad in uh, Rest of Maya. So like it started off pretty relatively quiet, but as you got more centered, sure, you, you know you're start you know, like anything. So that day, knowing that you're going like when you 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 know you're going to Ramadi, like what's the mindset around that? I mean, it's you're pretty vigilant. Yeah. Um, just because you obviously they they give you the the sit reps on you know situa situation awareness on like what's going on around the area mm -hmm. and so like you're daily being briefed every morning you know we woke up at uh, zero seven hundred just to have weapons check accountability check and then also just hey last twenty four forty eight seventy two hours bang 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 has gone on so they're trying to either locate they've caught or you know just have your even though we're inside mortar rounds because you're just basically like surrounded by a city you know. They do the best to kind of enclose the interior part of the, but then obviously they can make a mortar inside there. So when you're in like convoy going to the next place, like what vehicles are you, are you like in like mortar protected like vehicles? Are you like in mine protected? Like, yeah, just... we, we didn't, we were like, um, we were basically like in a semi. Okay. And um, then did you have like an escort? Like, were you escorted by like, yeah, we use, we typically, our convoys were set up to where, um, it was a huge supply run. Okay. So like we would have Iraqi locals, we would have Iraqi police, but we'd also be um, supported by like, like say like first armor, first cav, um, you know, other army sure. infantry patrols. You know, we weren't mainly, we just would kind of fall into that. So, I mean, you would have, gosh, sometimes you'd have a hundred vehicle convoy, you know, yeah. like they're big. But then, but if you're a supply run, you're a, you are a target. We're a target, point. absolutely, because I mean, anything they can do to keep, you know, even their own people from right. getting where it is they need. Because if they can of, supply their own, if the terrorist group yeah. can be the supplier, then, then you yeah. go back to winning hearts and minds. Right. It's just yeah, then they're just indebted. To, war. Yeah, wild. Yeah, that is. So how long were you deployed? And you did one or two, or I did two, two tours, deployments. two deployments, um, just one in each, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so with them being gone. Roughly, I was in country for like 11 months. Okay. So roughly close to a year, which typically is what those deployments were consisted of. So then when do you get out? At active duty? Yeah. Okay, so I did my final days there was, it would have been 2010, right? Yeah. And then what's life look like back um, home after being in that life for four years? It was a little confusion okay. just because of the structure of it all. Um and th there's pros and cons to it because, I mean, if you're the type of person that can handle that, which some people have to be told what to do. Yeah. And I I feel like then I was someone who just kind of needed to be told. I, well, I could execute. You've been coached through right. high I school. Mean, you've been coached. Yeah. Like, you always had a, you always had that ranking mm -hmm. of, like, who's going to be my command that tells me what needs to be done. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's why I, I'm the best entrepreneur yeah, I'm fine, you know, because I, I can take orders well and I can execute well. I mean, you know, so just because of you know, I've spent 25 plus years being just told what kind of what yeah. to do and how to do things. And that's always kind of just been my MO. Um, so, I mean, I had three months I was going back to school. I had actually um, part of the deal was for me to join the military was for me to go back to school. I thought that I needed to finally get a degree and I knew the best way was, you know, through the military because that was one of their perks of, you know, it was the post 9-11 GI Bill and going back to school full time. So I came home for the summer, worked a little bit, waiting on just the whole um, school thing to happen. Where were you working then? I had actually helped out the funeral home here in town okay. with Mr. Yeah. Jordan. Yeah. Um, he, I'd known them. I went to school with uh, one of their daughters and just family sure. friend and they just kind of helped me out um and so yeah i just kind of did some oddball things so then is it lakeland is it eastern oh, it? illinois state illinois state yeah. and so what's your what's your declared major i mean at the time i was going to try to become a teacher i was okay. going to try to go to um early education um, yeah so you're not a teacher yeah so then what happens <laughs> here well i mean um unfortunately part of the structure of the military is you sign a contract for eight years i did four years of active duty I had a choice to either go inactive, which at any time they could have just knocked on your door and said, hey, you're going, you're going somewhere. Yep. Or I could did the guard and decided that those one weekend a month, I could get yep. lecture money on top of them paying for my school and everything else and give me a stipend. It's like, I'll do that. You know, I just, why not? Easy money. Yeah. 
Well, if I had known, had a little crystal ball that they were going to send me a letter in the mail and involuntarily transfer me to another company that was going to deploy to Afghanistan in April of 2011. Um, you know, that would have probably looked a little different for me, but yeah. I didn't know. Um, I think they took advantage of the active duty status sure. and wanted to, they needed some bodies. Yep. And I just kind of fit the mold. So then what's the response to that letter? Since this is PG, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Them crappers. So then what's that, what's that, entail, like, what's that do for you? I mean, just, it was, you know, duty calls. So you I, deployed. I deployed. Um, it was, it was actually a really great deployment. Um, and how long was that deployment? Again, about roughly a year from okay. the time that we, we did a little in-state stuff, but technically we were gone for. And you were in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're really deployed. I mean, outside of being home now and then from 06 to 2012. Yeah. You're six years in. in, in yeah. It. Okay. yeah. So. Um, and had it calmed down at that point? That They had caught Bin Laden. Yeah. Um, and so that then it was more of them trying to slowly hand back the Afghans, you know, their country. Yeah. Um, in the sense of equipping them. Mm -hmm. with the things they needed to do as far as even like with us being heavy equipment operators, you know, that was my my job yeah. at some point during deployment, me and a few other guys, we actually were hands on with the Afghan army on showing them how to run heavy equipment, mm -hmm. how to push dirt, how to run cranes, how to set up properly and all these so it was that was pretty we had interpreters. Yep. We got really super close with them, like spent a lot so of time. So you didn't have to go them. to like language school or nope. anything like that. Nope. They 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 supplied us with uh, the interpreters, and there for a short span of time, I'd say in the last, well, not seven years ago, up until then, we actually communicated through email for quite a bit of time oh, after, wow. so yeah. this would have been three years after I'd been home, we were okay. still communicating. Nice. So this you get cool. home in 2012, mm -hmm. and then what's life look like? Well, I'd met my wife, who is my Yeah, Kelsey. when did you meet your Kelsey? So my Kelsey, we met in... Um, November of 2010. Okay. Um, and had you been in a relationship, like like a long-term relationship? Yeah, I high school I'd met, um, I had a girlfriend for about five years. Prior to that Prior, first deployment? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's kind of a whole high school high school yeah. thing. So you then know. you meet Kelsey prior to that, that 2011 letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we had just, we probably, we had just probably only been had known each other probably four months before that letter came. So what's that look like when you get back? Because you, I mean, Good. four or five months of like dating, right. courting, Good. and then you're gone, and no, now you're back. Because, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest, like, I had no real expectations going into that deployment with her. Yeah. Um, I made it fully aware that I wasn't like in it, Yeah. per se, um, because I, you witness a lot. Sure. And so, like, I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. Um, on top of distractions. Yeah. In a place where you need to be focused. Yeah. Mo mo more times than not. Um, you were and, trying to not take baggage. Yeah. With you, you're I like, mean, I've got. In a sense. Yeah. You know, because there were no real to attachments. To protect her too. Yeah, you know, and so, um, but she she was determined. Okay. You know, to uh, prove herself to be Love you know loyal. Fit. Yeah. Yeah, loyal and. Uh, so we get back and, you know, things start to become a little bit obviously more serious because she was, you know, she had proven herself and I, you know, I appreciated that. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a hard commitment for yeah. anyone, you know, to, to withstand someone being gone for that long of a time. And, you know, and even, with, even with Elizabeth, you yeah. know, who she had and how introduced Liz? at this time, she would have been three, well, four, five, four. Four or five, four or five yeah. right, range in there. So then when do you guys get married? 2014. Okay. We're on, this is year 10 for us. Congrats. Yeah. So then how do those 10 years look? Because that's 10 years. Well, <laughs> how do those eight years look? Because I've known you for two years. So okay. what do those eight years look like? Well, they weren't, um, I mean, they were obviously good. Yeah. Um, well, there's ups and downs. Yeah. There's good moments and uh, then there's the struggles. Right. Um, you know. A relatively good marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
we obviously had our, like you said, we had our issues with things, um, you know, and then like we, I mean, we had a really dark mm -hmm. period of time, you know, where, you know, I, you know, as the person who should be a leader of a family, mm -hmm. who wasn't, who was more cowardice, who stepped outside of his marriage to, because of, you know, I don't, I mean, I know why, but this would be a lot longer of a conversation sure. to have, but like basically to not blame, you know, my past, but like I had a lot of insecurities, yeah, a lot of um, parts of me that were just not mature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you think after doing all these things, witnessing all these things that, oh, uh, you know, you're, you've grown up. Yeah. Well, no, I probably hadn't or like at least yeah. at least that part. That I hadn't grown up to that yeah. part of, of a marriage. Like I didn't, I was never really coached that. Yeah. Because I never really witnessed that. Well, I think insecurities, no matter what your insecurity is, whether it's the way you look, the way you act, the way you talk, like when someone or something starts to feed that insecurity mm -hmm. for the positive, then temptation grows mm -hmm. and then sin comes mm -hmm. and then sin breaks things down. Mm -hmm. causes more trouble <laughs> and so how do you because your guys's marriage is a testament to to god and to work mm -hmm. and to to doing the work together so what changes that what what's the turning point in that time in your life well it's a few things honestly sure. i mean first it's uh well julie would have been 14. okay so julie's your niece niece um you know, it's my wife's sister's daughter. Um, she starts coming to youth group. Yep, starts coming to church. And then um, starts, mom drops her off, goes shopping, picks her up, <laughs> and keeps doing that routine. Yep. Joey's, come on, just come, just come. Yep. Come. So then, you know, that starts showing then up. Kelsey's sister starts coming to she church. She starts coming to church. Kelsey and I are obviously having our problems. Yep. Um, that realizes this. Tells Kelsey, you should start coming. You start coming. Well, we got the excuses. Um, Finally, she's like, well, I know soccer's done. Why aren't you going to come? So she came. Yep. I remember when Kelsey came. Yeah. And so uh, this would have been, and during this time, um, not only is our marriage, like, pretty much at rock bottom, and we're just... You're just living together. We're living together. Yeah. We, we are acquaintances. We are roommates. Roommates. Um, and my mom passes away during all this. And this is 2019. Or 18. 18, yep. Um mom passes away suddenly after 31 days or 24 days of being diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. kelsey's pregnant with, with pearson. pearson so when mom dies on a friday pearson's born the next friday mm -hmm. and so there's a lot going on there um to try to would manage. you say that was the hardest time in your life <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean yeah without it's a dark spot yeah emotionally yeah, like physically mentally like like yeah there was the emotions Any kind of, of your anxiety, mom stress, away, depression. And then the emotions of a new child, which you're happy for, but mm -hmm. you've got all these emotions, plus a third mm -hmm. child mm -hmm. adds some weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then how does, so Kelsey's coming to church, your mom passes away, you're dealing with all this. Yeah. Where are you at in all this? I am at home while she's going to church. Okay. And how long did she go to church before you... I don't know. I'll say five months. Okay. So then what changes this? Your dad. Okay. Kind of. Um, okay. On a communion. Okay. During a communion. So that, you're watching the live. You're watching on Facebook? Yeah, we got an argument. I was going to go. Argument <laughs> happens. Whatever. <laughs> she stays home. Um, she listens to it. I'm not listening to it. She tells me to come back. You should listen to this. I listen to it. And they were, you know basically someone you're here because either you're forced to or you don't know why and then he goes into just kind of as to why you should i hear it and I walk away so like it resonates mm -hmm. you know i'm letting it just kind of i'm not anyone that i not i don't act yeah you know i don't process i process it. i'm a processor because you know i don't want to overthink or just get too ahead of myself and right. get too excited and i've learned that about myself and then so yeah um after some serious thought um you know, and what I would soon later find out through conviction and mm -hmm. being tugged on by God, mm -hmm. um, I stepped foot into Truth and Grace Fellowship. Did you go the next Sunday? I don't remember. 
Yeah. I don't remember. So I'm, I'm pretty, Sunday. I'm pretty yeah. close. I mean, it probably. Yeah. So what's that look like? You stepping into church? It was, it was good. It helps again when being from here. Yeah. Um, there were, there, people there were a lot of people that I knew. Um, a lot of people shocked. Yeah. Adam was, they, they probably and the church pro- didn't burn down. And the church didn't burn down. Adam Locke <laughs> walks in and the church is still you know, Yeah, it's still there. Uh, no, I met uh, Glenn Diener was someone who just like beelined it right towards yeah. me. Um, and was really welcoming. Uh, had a lot of great things to say. And um, so then, yeah, we just started, we started showing up. And it was seriously like they had cameras in our house. Because everything that they, all the encounters were based off just our marriage, yeah. how we were treating each other, not mm-hmm. just how I had acted, but even how like things on her conviction of things that she knew that she was doing wrong, um, all that basis was starting to like really come to the forefront yeah. of where it was we were needing to fix our marriage. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like, that's the amazing thing about, you know, if you're a believer you have faith. Mm-hmm. Some people are like, well, I'm a follower of Christ, but I don't go to church. It's like mm-hmm. that message that you that you heard every Sunday that was convicting and speaking to you that you felt like like that's the power of the Holy Spirit working through the pastor. Mm-hmm. Because for someone else in a completely different spot in life could have felt the same way. Exactly. That it was speaking to them in a different way. And so now that you've been, you know, four years now, mm-hmm. like where do you see like what has changed in your life over the last four years? I'm just I'm so grateful. Um, Because it was hard um, to almost be another statistic of a divorced family and putting my family through another portion of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and to know that his, his, that God's love and grace and mercy is so real and pure mm-hmm. to, because you don't think that you're worthy enough of something and you are, yeah. you know, you really, really truly are. Um, but, you know, I, have Kelsey's made the comment, you know, that she was going and she was doing well. And then I started going and I caught fire and I just yeah. blew right past her, <laughs> you know, like, because it was just, it gave me purpose yeah. again. Um, and I'll talk about that even like, well, the Butler's Be Transformed panel tonight, um, because I needed that sense of purpose in my mm-hmm. life and I was seriously lost and it, and it's no no wrongdoing of my family's or my wife's. It was just like, we all just need that one extra thing um, to kind of help allow us to feel like, not so much, because I'm a firm believer in you lead by your actions. Yep. And I wasn't leading with my actions. My actions were definitely not the way to lead. Right. And this is probably the only way to lead a family is through Christ. Yeah. Um, and as long as I'm doing that and they see that change and they see what, what good comes out of all of his blessings, mm-hmm. whether, you know, even some of the bad conversations, yeah. like there's a blessing in all that. Yep. Um, even through all this bad things that happened, like that, it was a blessing mm-hmm. because like that doesn't happen Yeah. if it's not seen or done the right way. Yeah. Um, and so, well, I think your life is a testament to God's, like you said, God's grace and mercy. But then when you talk about action, like, and I think I've said it before on on this but also try to remind myself daily like we are creation Mm -hmm. and if we're trying to lead ourselves we're gonna fail because we aren't creator i'd be like trying to run everything by yourself in any organization Mm -hmm. or any show you know um it takes the one who created you to guide and lead you and then you put that that you know that obedience into action and so Creations need. I think your testimony and your is is a testament to to surrendering to your Creator's will for your life, and then out of that, then acting in obedience and doing the actions that He has called you to. Mm-hmm. Which now you've seen the growth, yeah, in the things that can come out of that. Not that every day is all sunshine and rainbows, no. 
but there is a guiding purpose in your life um, for your wife, for your kids, for your community, for the guys that are, you know, that look up to you. So, yeah, man, I think that's really, really good. Yeah, because I don't think that without, you know, stepping into that church for the first time is everything you see now is because of that. Yeah. You know, and that was that was his plan. Mm -hmm. Um, And without that, I don't meet you, Mm -hmm. you know, or my marriage doesn't get, you know, refined, retuned and and a totally new marriage. Um, I'm not doing devotionals with the church. I'm not leading discipleship groups. You know, I'm just, and on top of that, I, I know how not to overwhelm myself and allow the me to get the best of me. I got him to just put it all on because he wants all that. He wants all those burdens given to him because he wants to, he's the only person, because even here on earth, like he wants to see your success Yeah. because that's why he created you. I mean, we are vessels for other people, yeah. you know, to be able to lead and disciple. And so if it's not with yourself, it's also with your family and with your, you know, your loved ones and your friends. It's great. And because of that, like that's all the earthly things. But then at the end of the day, like because of your surrender and your belief, like now we are, have the assurance that like, Dads get to do eternity. Yeah. So that's exciting. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's like, like, yeah. like we get to do eternity in heaven. So that's awesome. Yeah. So. I, you know, we know we can, and I, and I said this before, um, and it took a lot of time for me to realize just how, how important it is for us to treat each other, um, you know, as we all want to be treated, because this is all, this is the only time that we get on here on earth. Because once we get to heaven, we're all going to love each other the same. Yeah. So, you know, if you're married or you have a relational with somebody, it's important to understand that this is the only time you get with that person. Yeah. Because once you get up to heaven, then I'm going to look at her, even though I love her the most here, I'm going to look at her as the same as I do as you. Right. And so, like, this is the only time that I have to love her as hard as I can mm-hmm. for the time I have left here on this earth. Because once she's gone or I'm gone, that's it. Yeah. That, that, it's done. And then our focus is on and him, it's on, and on him and And, yeah, exactly. and, there's and no there is no pain. There's no... no. Yeah, so that's a that's a great. I think that's the, I think that's the one to end on. Like, love those that God places in your life here hard and radically, mm-hmm. but then pursue and, and love Him with that passion here on earth too. So it's good. Yeah. Awesome. Good job. Now you can yeah. go pick up your kids. Yeah. Yeah, you got. Go. Oh yeah, I gotta go. Yeah, he's gotta go. Man. All right, man. Well, hey, that was an awesome one. Uh, thanks guys for listening. <laughs> we'll be back next week with Vince's bio. Mm. Peace. Hey.